Well, I know from several standard deviations to the right of the bell curve. Sure. Um, but sure. I believe sure. that we are Audio. smarter as a sure. group than sure. we are um, as individuals. And I want to maximize that brain power. In other words, I want to crowdsource you. Um, so let me know when you're ready. OK. Um, I'm Sandy Clark. And with me are Matt Blaze, um, Matt Elmore, and Dave, Dave Nelson Fisher. Matt Blaze and I are at the University of Pennsylvania. And Matt E. and, and Dave are not allowed to give you their affiliation. Um, but you can blame me for that. Um, how are we doing? This is, um, we have heard a lot of really fantastic talks about um, security today and insecurity today, and they have all basically focused on exactly the same thing. We are doing it wrong, um, at least the defender side is. The attackers are doing great. Um, and this is in spite of some incredible changes that ha have been made on the defender side. Um, this is, these quotes are from Symantec's current trend analysis report. Um, the total of number of vulnerabilities is on the rise. More vendors are affected. More sources are reporting vulnerabilities. There are new vulnerabilities for hire all the time. The severity is getting worse. The rise in designer vulnerabilities and the attacker race are getting faster. Um, in other words, the defenders are losing the arms race. Um, we're, we're doing it wrong. Well, if you're doing it wrong, then you need to either fix how you're doing it, or if it's not fixing it, fix, if you can't fix it, if it's not fixable. And I think that if any of you had a chance to hear Meredith and Sarah guys talk right in front of, before this one, you um, were probably surprised to hear that you know some of the ways that we have been trying to fix our problems reduce down to unsolvable. So then, we need to change the rules of the game. So first, I want to introduce to you um, Matt Blaze, who's going to talk about the honeymoon effect, um, which is research that we published in December of 2010 um, that led us to thinking about this in the first place. Then I'm going to introduce um, um, Dave Elmar, who's going to talk about the OODA loop and why it matters. And then, um, nope, Matt, you're talking about that the OODA loop and why it matters. And then Dave is going to talk, talk about um, military strategy that relies on it that he thinks is directly applicable to our um, cybersecurity arms race. And then I'm going to tie it into a new, well, new for us, but not new in the evolutionary biology world, hypothesis that I think directly and fundamentally applies here. Right. And, and just, just so everybody knows, we now have a Q&A mic. So if anybody wants to open a dialogue with the Excellent. thing, please come to the mic so it's on the recording. Thank you. So um, I'm, a, I'm a computer science professor, and well, no, I know, I, that's because I pushed the B button. I, I know how this, I'm a computer science professor. I know how this works. <laughs> um, so the, um, so I'm, a, I'm a computer science professor, and um, what I you know, do and what my colleagues do or what we you know, are supposed to be doing is, is advancing the state of computer science. And I look at my colleagues in, um, you know, people doing graphics and uh, things like that. And they do this wonderful job of uh, producing, you know, nice artifacts that do wonderful things. And I, you know, when I show up for faculty meetings, you know, um, people ask me what I do, because they don't really know. And I say computer security, and they, you know, they, they look at me as if, uh, oh yeah, you're in the branch of computer science that's making negative progress instead of the branch that's making forward progress. You know, and we, you know, as, as time goes on, as systems get bigger, they become more wonderful and less secure. And that's been, you know, consistently true throughout the, the course of our enterprise. Now, part of the, the reason for that is we're not the only failing branch of computer science. There's another big problem in computer science that's um, um, been around and unsolved for quite a while, and that's the problem of how do we write programs that work as we expect them to do. That is, how do we write software that, that does not have bugs? Now, that, that problem has been um, um, 
understood to be a problem before we networked computers together, before we understood that that question had security implications. So in fact, it's been studied for a long time. It's been studied kind of since the beginning of computer science. How do we write programs that, that, that work and behave as expected? So I'm going to uh, put up a, a, a graph here. Does anybody recognize this graph? Has anybody seen this before? Right. Yeah, it, it, it sort of is. Um, it, it's, uh, this is a, uh, a graph from Brooks's Mythical Man Month from 1975, um, and it is basically telling you about the interarrival rate of bugs in software. And he looked at, you know, software packages back when computers were these big things um, and very expensive, and, you know, writing programs was expensive because it used a lot of computer time to run compilers, right? So, you know, having bugs was wasteful because you'd have to go back and run your compiler, so they studied, um, they studied the arrival rate of bugs. And what does this graph tell you? Well, it tells you that early in the life cycle, your interarrival rate of the next bug is very, very fast. You get lots of lots of bugs at the beginning, and as, as these bugs get fixed, the software gets better. It improves with age. You are reducing the number of bugs and lengthening the arrival rate for the next bug. What this is telling you is that old software is better than new software, right? If you get brand new software, it's got all of the easy bugs in it, it's really crappy, it's going to crash really soon, wait a little while, like like wine, it improves with age. Now eventually it starts to, there's an uptick again because the obscure bugs start getting found, but that's way, way later. So this is 1975, that's, you know, prehistoric computer science as far as many people are concerned. Um, so, you know, this graph, it turns out, has been remarkably stable over time. This is the same graph made by someone else in 2008. You know, it essentially looks just like Brooks. Interarrival rate is fast at the beginning and um, then eventually slows down. So if we're interested in the question of, um, well, how do we reduce the number of vulnerabilities in software, what we, we would tell people, you know, if we assume that vulnerabilities or software vulnerabilities at least are a type of bug, is, you know, make the software better, right? Work really hard, you know, get the software until you're a little late in that curve, until you've moved out on that curve a little bit, and at that point the software will be more secure and you'll expect your vulnerability arrival rate to have at least um, slow down. And in fact, you know, a lot of computer security practice, you know, is focused on the idea of, well, let's focus ourselves on making our software as good as possible because, you know, if we take the time to make it right, um, then we will have fewer vulnerabilities. So that kind of makes sense, right? Better software is more secure, right? Right? Makes perfect sense. Okay, in fact, it's, it's, you know, why have I just wasted a couple minutes of your time even making this point? So the first question we wanted to ask is, well, is this actually true? Do vulnerabilities behave like bugs? Um, and in fact, what we found, we took a look at the 40-some-odd most popular software packages, and we looked at the rate at which exploitable vulnerabilities are reported in this software from its release date. So this is the subset of bugs that are exploitable vulnerabilities. And we you know, basically drew the same thing as the Brooks graph. And what we got were graphs that looked like this. That uh, in fact the uh, arrival rate of bugs doesn't go down, of vulnerabilities doesn't go down, it goes up at the beginning of the life cycle. In fact, what, what happens is right after software is released, in general, the time between release and the first exploit is considerably greater than the time between that first exploit and the second exploit, and the second exploit and the third exploit, and so on and so on, for quite a while until you get late in the life cycle. And only later does that interarrival rate start to go um, up uh, again. So there's this honeymoon period at the beginning. So software is more like milk than like wine, right? Older is, is unless you like cheese, right? But older is worse. And that, you know, from a security point of view. So this is, you know, surprising. It's, it, what it suggests is the quality of the software. By the way, the quality of the software is getting better during that time. The bugs are getting fixed. But when the software is at its worst, it's 
going to take it longer before the, vulnerable, the exploitability is discovered in it. So what that suggests is there's this honeymoon period. You can release really crappy software early on, and it won't be um, attacked until the attacker learning curve catches up with your really crappy software. What does this suggest to us? Well, it suggests some really crazy things. It suggests things like, well, instead of reusing old code, what we should do is every time we have a new release, we should delete all of the source code for the old release and start over. And that will reset our honeymoon. Now, from a software you know, uh, engineering point of view, that may have economic disadvantages to do it, it that way. It may not be a very popular approach, but in fact, it may lead to more security in practice if we just keep throwing our software out and rewriting it from scratch every time we want to uh, make a change in it. Now, hopefully, there are um, alternatives to doing this that are better. We can take advantage of the, um, we can take advantage of the attacker having a learning curve the same way um, we have a development curve and force the attacker to um, learn about our software every time and reset this honeymoon effect. But I think that remains kind of a, an open question. So with that, we wanted to look at other people who are worried about not just building up good defenses, but considering the attacker that they're, they're up against. And the, the military seems like the, the uh, body of thinking that's been asking the question, how do we consider the attacker in our defenses um, for longer than us software people have? So. Shout. Does your graph take into account the fact that um, it might take some time before someone adapts new code, let's say, or a new release? Yeah, that's, that's, that, wh that's that where the effect is coming from, right? So, you know, the, the, all the vulnerabilities are in there at the beginning. It, this is the rate at which these vulnerabilities are being discovered. Um, hold on, and, and, and let's wait till after, because we, we have a hell of a lot of information to throw at you and not enough time if we're going to allow you guys to participate. So, uh, we're intimately connected with the military. Uh, you know, from Trojan is is a military metaphor. Uh, you've got onion routing, bug. If you believe the folk etymology coined by by a, you know a, a navy officer, uh, even Tor is is a, a DoD project. The internet itself. So you've got two cultures that that are intimately tied to each other. Uh, so taking a look at, at modern military theory. There's this guy, John Boyd, and I had, I had a whole bunch of slides I was going to give you on John Boyd and how awesome he is. I don't have time for any of that. So uh, John Boyd is what happens if you give a hacker a jet fighter. Uh, a <laughs> that's, a, that's right. Yeah, 40 second Boyd, he could, he could uh, kill anyone in the sky in 40 seconds. Uh, he's outstanding. So, so Boyd, his, his key contribution to modern military theory was the idea of an, an OODA loop. This is the uh, observation, orientation, decision, and action cycle. And at, at its simplest, you look at this, you've got, on the left, you've got observations. Uh, the, the big octagon is your, your orientation. Uh, you've got your, and then you've, you move through decision and into to action. You, you're testing a hypothesis. And it seems like a very linear thing. Uh, sort of easy to look at, but there's a lot of complexity built into this. Uh, if you can see, there's a lot of recursion. So observation is fed by both the, the unfolding circumstances, the environmental considerations, uh, and the outside information that you're, you're getting to understand the environment in which you're at. Uh, this feeds into your, your orientation. Your orientation is based upon the things that drive how you perceive the world that you live in. This is your genetic heritage, your, your cultural traditions, your previous experience, all these things that, that make up who you are in that moment. Um, you also have the new information that's fed by your observation, and you're performing your analysis, you're performing your synthesis, you're, you're breaking down your component parts and then recombining them in novel ways to to perceive a, a new opportunity or a new way to move. And based off of all of these, this, this melting pot of, of ideas and information, you pull it together and you make that decision. You, you choose your best course of action on how you're going to, to uh, attack the problem set. And your whole intent is winning. Your whole intent is to get ahead of your enemy because your enemy is trying to get ahead of you. So 
uh, once you've made your decision, you're going to, to take action on that, and you're going to, to try and stop your enemy, encourage them to lose, and, and encourage your own winning. And this is a descriptive model. This is not proscriptive. This is not, oh, if I go do this, I win. No, I, I mean, if you look at this, this is, this is wolves and rabbits, right? This is, this is purely descriptive. This is kind of how things unfold. Uh, but it's in the understanding that, and the simplicity, complex simplicity, that, that you, you really open yourself up to, to see all of the opportunities inside of this, this model. And so you see the recursion here that your orientation is shaping how you observe things. And uh, it's simultaneously shaping the decisions you're going to make. Your decisions and actions are changing your environment. Um, point I forgot to mention is uh, uh, in the OODA loop, Boyd has synthesized uh, the second law of thermodynamics, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, and Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Okay, and so he says he says uh, any system in and of itself is going to generate entropy without some kind of outside in information. Uh, Any time I try to observe a system, it's going to change on me, and I can't know the completeness or the state of the system from being inside the system. And so from this, he says, he says, my goal is to gather more information from the outside to better prepare myself, to share that information out with the people around me, and to ensure that, that we're better informed. Simultaneously, I want to cut off the information from my opponent. I want to, I want to discourage his lines of communication. I want to keep him from being aware of, of the true reality, the true nature of things. I need, to, I need to deceive him. I need to put blinders on my enemy. And so, uh, with the OODA loop, it's very common, people look at this because uh, people commonly interpret this as, well, okay, so if I move faster and faster, if I cycle through this quicker, then, then I just get ahead of my enemy. I, I, I'm moving so fast that he just can't keep up with the pace of change. But it's not explicitly that. The OODA loop is about responsiveness. It's about your ability to, to do the right thing in the right second. Uh, Boyd was, was fond of using a, a phrase from the, the German generals of World War II. He called it Fingerspitzengefühl, uh, which uh, translates roughly as, as fingertip feel. It's the idea that you have such a, a broad and encompassing knowledge of the, the conditions, the opportunities, the, the techniques that you can use in that situation that you've, you've evolved a, um, an implicit understanding of the conditioning and you just pull out the right thing at the right time and you apply it. And that's what you need to do is, is you have this, this chance to say, this is what's happening, and without even really thinking about it, you're already applying the next step to, to respond to that. And that's all based on this new information and this previous experience and this knowledge. And so uh, what you're doing is you're trying to move through your, your cycles more responsibly, and simultaneously you want to lengthen out and deny your enemy the ability to, to uh, perform the same cycles so that as they see your response, it takes them so long to understand what you've just done that you've already moved two and three steps ahead before they can even respond to it. And simultaneously, you are so aware of what they're doing that you can respond nearly instantaneously to anything that they're throwing at you. So with that, uh, we'll look at some of the, the classic models in warfare and how they apply equally well. Uh, so, right. Originally saw Mouse's talk on the honeymoon effect. I thought it was pretty intriguing. And I looked at it from a very different standpoint. I have not been technically current since the BBS days when I was hanging out on Nirvana Net. So bear with me. This is not about the technical aspects, it's about the human aspects. So when I looked at the honeymoon effect and Buddy Matt is telling me all about the OODA loop, which I see fundamentally as two intelligent beings interacting and trying to gain the upper hand through deception, through either speeding up their own processes, improving themselves, or basically fucking with the enemy. Deceiving him, getting inside of his decision cycle, making him do things that he wouldn't normally do, controlling the tempo. So what I came, the conclusion I came to, and something that I hear all the time, is how different cyber is how different network warfare is. I think that is a fundamentally flawed assumption. If you have two human beings, it doesn't matter the tools, whether it's sticks and stones or it's computers interacting via network, it's still human being against human being. So the same rules of conflict apply. Throughout military history, you have key principles that have been forgotten and relearned over and over and over again. The same things apply in cyber. 
The trick and the challenge, especially for you guys, is to one, recognize that fact, and two, figure out how to adapt the language and the, that knowledge and apply it within this space. So the first point I want to make is why you've already lost and you're in a hopeless situation. So the bottom line on this is you cannot go on the offense. Now, I'm not talking nation states or transnational organizations that ignore the rules, but for most people, you can't go out and DDoS somebody that's attacking you. You cannot engage in any form of offensive action. Therefore, you can never really get the initiative. At best, you can stalemate on that count. You can't preemptively attack them in a traditional sense. You can try and influence their UDA cycle. You can influence their thinking. You can try and stop an attack before it occurs using psychological operations or de-incentivizing the attack. But you can't engage in any direct action. Once an attack occurs, you can't even counterattack. All you can try and do is mitigate the damage done to slow them down and to divert them and to try and protect what's most important. I, I was going to go in depth into fixed fortifications and why they're a really, really bad idea, but General Patton put it best. There are monuments to the stupidity of mankind. And when I look in a, a lot of the talks between Black Hat, DEF CON, and here at ShmooCon, you look at the model that we've adopted, and because we can't go on the offense, it's inherently passive, and most defenses are fixed static. You put up your trench, you put up your wall, and you hope no one breaches it. That doesn't work. And I know we're going to get to this later, but my challenge to you guys, so I give you a little bit of time, find me an example of a static, fixed, passive defense that ever worked in history. I can't find one. So I'd be really interested if anyone else can. It doesn't work. So why are we using this as the model? It's just so broken that I don't understand. So just remember General Patton just said say no to fix that defense. So when you were looking at this, Stephen Biddle wrote a book called Military Power. And it fundamentally reshaped the way people modeled and, and simulated conflict. So up until this point, they were focused on the technology, they were focused on numbers, so how many tanks versus how many tanks, and what are the capabilities of those tanks. They did not take into account how those forces were used in any way, shape, or form. It was just pure numbers. And he saw that as fundamentally flawed. And he provides some very, very illustrative examples. So the first one is World War I, which I, I love as an example, because in World War I, very early in the war, it stagnated. You got into this trench warfare, and unlike cyber, where everything is advanced to offense, in World War I, everything was advanced to defense. They had all this new technology. All of a sudden, they could pour millions of rounds of artillery. So they emphasized artillery fire over maneuver, over the infantry. So they got bogged down. They built wonderful static defenses. And they could never get beyond the range of their artillery. So they went back and forth for three and a half years. Now, when I asked this question all the way up to this con, most respondents, what changed that? Why, after three and a half years, did the Germans manage a breakthrough and then we returned to this maneuver warfare that ended up ending the war? Why weren't they just perpetually stuck in this cycle? That's a common answer. Anybody else? Gas, planes, uh, another common one is logistics. No. The, and the classic example of why that is a, and I thought so too, until I read Biddle, and, and he makes a brilliant argument for it, enough to convince me, absolutely, is it had nothing to do with technology. And that was one of the great tragedies, is we took technology and we believed that technology was that solution. It wasn't. Sound familiar? <laughs> <laughs> so Operation Michael was the first return to maneuver warfare. So it's his ex he uses two, ex two key examples, right? The extremes to test the theory. So if it is force employment that matters, then his model's correct, and these things happen. If it's not correct, 
then these two incidents, these two operations, should never have been successful. So Operation Michael, Second Battle of the Somme, the Germans have only a two to one ratio. Sounds good. The normal rule of thumb is three to one if you're going to attack. Typically, attacks with four to five to one ratios were still defeated because they hadn't adopted the modern system of warfare using cover, concealment, a different way of using the forces they already had. So what the Germans did was they, had, they retrained all these units. They came up with a fresh doctrine. They had, I think, six tanks total that most of them were broken down for the operation. So tanks, no play. The systems in place between artillery, rifles, everything pretty much the same, they managed to break through. Massive breakout. They completely destroyed the defense. They didn't get very far. That's another story. But the point is, they adapted what the tools that they had, they just used them in a different manner. They went back in history to understand why what they were doing was really, really dumb, and how can we use things like Sun Tzu, Jomni, all these guys that really emphasize maneuver warfare to figure out a way out of this mess. And it worked. His example on the defensive side was in World War II, Operation Goodwood. The Allies, the Brits, had six to one ratio. Tanks, aircraft, everything. Roughly technologically equivalent, but six to one ratio. You, you should be golden at that point. The problem was the Germans were using the modern system. So rather than putting all their forces online and digging them into trenches and using fixed fortifications and having high density all the way at the front, they spread their forces out. They used defense in depth. So they took all these units and spread them over 16 kilometers in depth, whereas the typical at the start of the war was about three to five kilometers. So that gave them way more time to react to the threat and to slow down the allies enough so that they could mount a counterattack. They were able to respond because they were able to slow the enemy down. They got inside the Oogaloo. So I was going to go into way more detail, but if you want more, you can hit me offline. So what this tells me is the main thing is realize that it's human conflict and old things apply. Sun Tzu is just as relevant now as, it, as he was in the days of Napoleon, as he was in World War I, World War II, etc. Human conflict fundamentally doesn't change. It's a battle between minds. So we need to adopt some of those lessons of history and try to adapt them to this current environment. So I call it aggressive defense. I, I went back and forth on what to call it numerous times. But the bottom line is, Know what you want to defend. What is important? Does it really matter if some random B-tards get into your network and start printing black sheets of paper? Does that really kill your company? Does that do any actual damage? As you said, a couple hundred bucks in toner cartridge. Yeah, it's a pain in the ass. Or even if they deface your website. Yeah, it's a little black mark, but it's not really critical to your operations. So you should be probably focusing more of your effort rather than spreading it across your entire network. You should be focusing your attention on what matters. And first, you have to determine that. The TTL talk given earlier today emphasized that. Know what it is that actually matters, what you actually want to defend, and then prioritize your efforts around that. It doesn't matter if they get into the faxes that much. So the second thing, and this is something that also kills me on the defense side in cyber, is where's the deception? Sun Tzu, basic point, you can pretty much summarize the entire book. The art of war is deception. It's that simple. So you see it all the time on the offense. They figure out all kinds of creative ways to camouflage their actions, to misdirect. Where is that on the defensive side? I don't know. Like I said, back in the BBS days, I don't know. I don't know how to apply it now. That's your challenge. So we're running out of time. So the third thing, defend in depth. Figure out ways to adapt the modern system, all the things we've learned, which aren't modern at all. They go all the way back and apply it. Basic things like pace planning, so primary, alternate, contingency, emergency plans. And all that is designed to buy you time so you can react. 
Number four, always improve your position. You have to know how to attack. About 30 seconds. Sun Tzu, <laughs> so Sun Tzu, everyone knows the quote, know your enemy, know yourself, you don't have to fear the outcome of a thousand battles. They forget another key quote that goes along with that, in order to know your enemy, you have to become your enemy. So as network defenders, you have to understand offense just as well as a black hat. Otherwise, you're screwed. And the limit attack surface area had a whole nice thing, but nothing can match what Mudge put up at the keynote, or if you saw his talk back at DEF CON or Black Hat, same thing. Defense has this massive attack surface area, which is bad. Offense, very low. So we've got to figure out ways to reduce that. Yeah, that. Thank That's. you very much. I, I wish uh, I had time to let these guys talk more. Um, we have masses of references that can, can get you up to speed in, in what, um, how we understand this and how we're thinking about this. So we um, used or found out about the OODA loop when we were trying um, to look at military history and in particular at the history of military strategy to understand the honeymoon effect. But that isn't the only place that we were looking. We were also looking at um, current ecology and evolutionary biology research. And to our surprise, we found evidence of the OODA loop there too. And even better, we found a hypothesis, this one that I'm going to tell you about, that's fundamental to describe the cybersecurity ecosystem. Um, so at first, we were looking at um, predator versus prey um, models, because it's really easy to think of attackers as predators and defenders as prey. Um, but it doesn't really fit. Um, you don't see these sort of graphs, um, uh, the, the sine wave sort of graphs, um, in a um, cybersecurity model. And, and we didn't see them in the honeymoon um, effect um, data that we were looking at. The, the graphs between attackers and defenders in cybersecurity seem to be more linear until they, ta they um, sort of level out because um, the interest or something else, some other extrinsic property changes. Um, so um, we think this is because of the assumptions that are made in predator versus prey. The, the most common um, Lotka Volterra um, equations um, depend on an assumption which says that, that um, basically during the process the environment must not change in favor of one species over another and the genetic adaptation must be sufficiently slow. And that doesn't happen in cybersecurity at all. There are always these surprises. Somebody um, does something that changes the, the whole um, situation and the ad adaptation rate, there's plenty of research that shows that it's just getting faster and faster. Um, um, and one of the things we think that doesn't work is because in predator versus prey, the predator actually kill off the prey, but in cyber security, it's not in the predator's best, best interest to kill off the people that are attacking. They don't make any money off of that. Um, so what is it instead? It's parasite host. And why does this matter? Well, because there, there are two basic competing hypotheses in the, um, in the evolutionary biology world about parasite hosts. and. Um, the one that makes um, the most sense, the one and the one that actually is carrying the most weight in, in their world right now, um, the one that matters to the honeymoon effect, the one that demonstrates the, the OODA loop, um, and the one that may provide us with insight on how we should be going about defending ourselves, is something called the Red Queen Hypothesis. Now, the Red Queen Hypothesis um, was um, presented by L. Van Valen in 1973, so it really hasn't been out around that long, but it's, it's pretty much the most dominant one right now. And it gets its name from Alice Through the Looking Glass. At one point, the Red Queen tells Alice, it takes all the running I can do just to stay in the same place. Um, and what does that define? That's the arms race. Um, what did, um, did they mention here? But um, the best you can do is stalemate. And that is the hypothesis I'm proposing to you. We can't get any better than that. So the Red Queen hypothesis, um, in formal terms, for an evolutionary system, continuing development is needed in order to maintain its fitness relative to the systems with which it is co-evolving. When we measured the honeymoon effect, what we were measuring was how fast attackers adapted to defenders' new code and to defenders' changes in their code, whether it was a major version or a minor version. And you could see different effects of that. Um, in other words, how long it took them to observe, orient, defend, and act. 
This is adaptation in response to evolutionary pressures. Um, and when we looked at the defender side of things, the defenders follow the Brooks mythical man month model and they do not adapt well in response to attacks. Um, in spite of how good software has gotten, you know, in spite of how much longer it takes to turn a vulnerability into a working exploit, we are losing this arms race. Um, and if you need m proof of that, go watch Branson's TTL penetration talk. And why are we doing this wrong? Because the models we use depend on, on t are, 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 are based on one of two things. Either we use something I call the Center for Disease Control model. We inoculate ourselves against every known virus we possibly can, and then we stick ourselves out there and we wait to get attacked. Or we use the fortification, the castle and moat model, in which we build this really strong fortification and we stick ourselves inside and we put a moat around it and we carefully control our ingress and our egress and then somebody digs under the wall. Um, a purely defensive strategy is a losing one. Um, as Meredith and, and Sergey demonstrated, trying to protect, protect against every possible way that um, we m might ha have a bug and we might, uh, that bug might get exploited is a losing proposition. It is, it is mathematically reduced to an unsolvable problem. We can't count on just fixing bugs to protect us. Um, you can't win a war if, you're pa if your, your methodology is to patch and to pray. So if you've been <laughs> attending any of the talks today, what you've really been hearing are methods and, and people expressing the need for adaptation in response to or in the face of threats. Everything mentioned in the op for attack, uh, um, the op for talk um, was a good example of key elements for intelligent and successful adaptation. Um, but you can say the Red Queen hypothesis is just a hypothesis. It isn't even good enough to call a theory. Um, what good is this for cybersecurity if we can't really measure or predict adaptation rates in the real world? Um, what about real life examples? Um, particularly real life examples that involve bad guys intelligently doing bad things to good guys. Well, there's this. Oops, where are we? Um, on the right here, can you hear me? On the right here, is a publication in Science, a technical report in July. On the left here is the Wired article about it. Um, what the, this physicist, a mathematician, and a couple of military guys proved in this paper is that they can, they can use the Red Queen hypothesis and a particular set of equations, and they provide you with both the equations and the, um, the data set so that you can reproduce their results to predict deaths in Fallujah. Why? Because they're measuring the adaptation rate of the insurgents, the, what they're calling the Red Queen, against the adaptation rate of, the, of us, which they refer to as the Blue King. And if the Blue King does not adapt f fast enough in response, or well enough, or smart enough in response to the Red C Queen, the attack rate goes up. The death rate goes up. This is real life stuff. And if they can do it, so can we. But now is where I need to turn the time over to you guys, because what kind of data can we use to test this? What kind of experiments should be, we be running? Um, if you think we're full of shit here, let us know that, but you've got to back it up. Um, this isn't religion, this is science. We need data, and we need to be able to, to prove this in some way. So uh, any questions, any ideas, please make use of any one of the mics. Um, I open the floor to you. Hold on. We do have, by the way, a little bit more um, information, but I, so I'm running out of time. Um, uh, here, going back to the, the talk about cheating, the only way to win this game is to change the rules. And to give you some, some things to think about, here are some questions we want answers. Here's some challenges for you. Um, there's a couple of people. Come ahead. I'll, I'll moderate the best I can. I was just wondering how many of you folks have gone over the output of the um, National Cyber Leap Year Summit because there were a couple of working groups, uh, one of the ones that I was on in particular about moving target defense, 
that would seem to have, there were some suggestions that came out of there for directions that would seem to correlate pretty closely with what you're talking about. And I was just wondering how much of any of that has gone into uh, your thinking. And also kind of, since I know most of it's sort of targeted toward the academic research community and maybe the government contracting community, it, what, I think anybody in this room could read that stuff and understand it, but if you have any ideas about how best to make it assimilable, I think that would be pretty valuable. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think one of the things that's interesting here is, you know, it runs so counter to what we all believe, you know, as one side of our computer science brain, right, says, we can win, right? We just have to 